Imagine, just imagine a herd of Alamosauruses migrating southwards, kicking up dust as they rumble across the landscape, and suddenly the sky is darkened by a flying creature, and one of the Alamosaurs looks towards the heavens and sees the light blotted out momentarily as a huge creature flies overhead. And that creature is a Quetzalcoatlus, a massive pterosaur that used to dominate the Cretaceous skies. The largest flying reptile ever. In fact, the largest vertebrate to have ever taken to the skies. It had a wingspan estimated to be up to 11 meters, which is wider than that of an F-16 fighter jet. What a magnificent beast. So Quetzalcoatlus is named after the Aztec god, the serpent, the feathered serpent god. And that's quite an appropriate name, you have to admit. There are different estimates as to the size of this creature, but currently they reckon it weighed between 200 and 250 kilograms. And when it was on the ground, it was as tall as a giraffe. So what an amazing beast. So welcome to the Dinozone in the next video in the series on dinosaurs and paleontology. And in this video, we're going to look at pterosaurs, the creatures that ruled the skies throughout the Mesozoic. They were revolutionary. They were revolutionary not only because they were the first reptiles capable of flight, but also being the first vertebrates to be able to fly. So they were pioneering. So all due respect to the pterosaurs, they led the way. So in this video, we're going to learn about when they lived, where they lived, how they evolved, how they flew, and we're going to learn something about the paleontologists who dug them up and how they got their name. All right, so let's crack on. So if we haven't met, my name's Gerald Davey. I am the Dino Man. I head up the Dino Zone. And we have a physical dinosaur park where we've got a replica of a T-Rex. And, um, and we're making these little videos about paleontology and dinosaurs and prehistoric life. So we're looking forward to sharing all of these paleontological adventures with you. So if you can't make it to the Dinozone Dinosaur Park, you'll just have to follow us here on YouTube. And I know you might be watching this from anywhere in the world, so um, lovely to have you here and uh, looking forward to having you along on this adventure. Right, so let's reach for those skies. So pterosaurs are those amazing flying reptiles that flourished during the Mesozoic. So I don't know if you know this, uh, we talk about this in our other videos, but the Mesozoic started about 251.2 million years ago and it ended at 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct after a huge asteroid hit the planet. So that was the era in which the dinosaurs lived more famously and we also had pterosaurs ruling the skies and plesiosaurs ruling the oceans. So that's another video you can go and check it out. I'll put the link down in the description below. All right so that's a quick overview of the Mesozoic. Mesozoic meaning middle life. There might be a little bit of roar going on. We are being subject to a massive cold front that is sweeping across the country. It's going to put snow on the mountains and the rain's coming down and uh, making a bit of a noise on my tin roof. But that's okay. Seeing we're on dinosaur adventures, there's nothing wrong with a bit of rain and a bit of noise on a, on a tin roof just to keep it interesting. So now, so now's a good time to tell you that pterosaurs were not dinosaurs. They lived at the same time as dinosaurs, but they certainly weren't dinosaurs. So that's a fallacy, although they are related, both being archosaurs or ruling reptiles. And it's the same family in which the dinosaurs and the crocodiles and the birds also belong. So stick with us through to the end because we've got this amazing thing going on now. At the end of each video, there's going to be a secret code that you're going to punch into the software after you've collected all 10 of those codes. And those codes are going to open the keys to the dinosaur kingdom. And I'll talk more as we go through the series of 10 videos, what is behind those gates. So make sure you stick around. I'll give you the key verbally, write it down. So I might even put the link to a PDF document that you can go and download with the name of the video and the code. And then once you've collected all 10 of them, um, I'll direct you to another link and you can punch those codes in and you will be amazed what you find. So stick around to the end. We can't wait to have you along on this adventure. Um, it's like going on a dinosaur hunt and a treasure hunt all rolled into one. A dinosaur paleontological expedition. 
So, welcome to this adventure. And when you get to the end of it, you're going to get that key into the Dinozone Dinosaur Kingdom. And to find out what's behind those gates, stick around as we work our way through these 10 videos. Okay, so let's crack on with pterosaurs. So two of the very early pterosaurs from the Triassic, the first period of the Mesozoic, were Eudimorphodon and Pitinosaurus. These were relatively small creatures, lacking some of the iconic features we normally associate with pterosaurs. Their wings were likely made up of a membrane of skin which stretched between an elongated fourth finger and the body. These early pterosaurs probably lived in trees and glided from branch to branch. Over time, however, some of these early flying reptiles diversified and evolved into a wide variety of forms. Some like Quetzalcoatlus grew to colossal sizes. And as we've seen, wingspans exceeding 11 meters, 33 feet if you will, which is greater than the wingspan of an F-16 fighter jet. Others developed long slender wings for soaring, while some adopted more robust bodies for powered flight. The apex of pterosaur diversity occurred during the late Cretaceous period when spectacular species like, like Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsegopteryx ruled the skies. And as we have already seen, Quetzalcoatlus stood as tall as a giraffe when on the ground. These, these huge pterosaurs represented some of the largest flying creatures to have ever, ever existed. So William Stout, that famous dinosaur and fantasy artist, drew a picture of Quetzalcoatlus, which was the inspiration for my opening lines. And although not very accurate by today's standards, he drew that picture back in the 1980s. It kind of sets the scene, you know, this whole romantic idea of this huge pterosaur flying over a herd of sauropods, alamosaurs as they were migrating south, and this huge creature winging overhead blocking out the sun. And he drew a couple of those sauropods looking up towards the heavens as this dark shadow passed overhead. Really quite amazing. So well done to William Stout. You should go and get his book. Maybe I'll put the link in that below too, so you can go and check out all his amazing pictures. The great thing about William Stout, and some of those images might be inaccurate now, but he kind of set these dinosaurs in a natural world with all sorts of other creatures, and there's some very evocative pictures of triceratops walking over the crest of a hill surrounded by all these pterosaurs, like birds, egrets, around a herd of cattle nowadays in, in the more modern world. So the question is, how did these creatures develop the ability to fly? And that's quite a tricky one to answer. We can't get in too deep. But certainly the ancestors of pterosaurs developed the ability to walk on two legs, their rear legs, their hind legs. And that freed their arms up, their forelimbs. And these were then free to develop into wings. And some of them took the opportunity to learn how to fly and take to the skies. So that's putting things in a very simple manner. I don't know if we'll ever work out exactly how that thing took place. So the wings that they evolved, that they developed, was made up of a membrane of skin similar to that of bats. However, in bats, all the fingers except the thumb support the membrane, whereas in pterosaurs, only the fourth finger supports that membrane that makes up the wing. The other fingers, pterosaurs only have four fingers, and the other three are maybe were used for climbing, climbing in trees or whatever. So it's only that one finger that supports that entire membrane that keeps this animal aloft. So when the pterosaur was not in flight, that famous finger, the long one, and the membrane were extended rearward along the flanks of the creature. In addition to the main flight membrane, an accessory membrane stretching between the shoulder and wrist reduced turbulence on the wing. And then embedded within the wing was a system of fine, long keratinous fibers that ran parallel to one another like the feathers of birds. This arrangement gave strength to the wing and, and increased the maneuverability of the creature while it was flying. So, that, so the name pterodactyl actually means wing finger, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this video when we talk about how the, the first paleontologist who discovered these animals and how they described them. So um, yeah, but pterosaur, wing, well, pterodactyl, that was the original name. So the name pterodactyl actually means wing finger. They sported coats of hair-like filaments known as pycnofibers, which covered their bodies and parts of their wings. So pycnofibers grew in several forms, from simple filaments to branching down-like feathers. And these may have been similar to the down feathers found on both avian 
birds and non-avian dinosaurs. So they might have had a downy furry appearance, but they certainly weren't feathers that, like birds that they were able to fly with. However, the fact that early feathers are found on both pterosaurs and dinosaurs would suggest that there's a common ancestor for both dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And those downy feathers might have been used as insulation. So in reality, pterosaurs would have had a smooth, fluffy coat that did not, however, resemble bird feathers. So what else can we learn about pterosaurs? Well, they had compact bodies and the hind legs were long and slender like those of birds and they were easily able to support the animal on land. Despite considerable size of the forelimbs, the bones were hollow and thin-walled, which kept weight down. And that's an important thing when a creature is trying to keep itself aloft. We all know that when a jumbo jet takes off, laden with fuel and passengers, it needs a lot of runway. And the same thing when it lands. But a much lighter plane can get itself off the ground using far less fuel, and the landing is always far easier too. So. Lightness, when it comes to flight, is a very, very important consideration. And to keep weight even further down, they had air sacs on their bones. And that's a problem in terms of the preservation of bones, because some of those bones are very, very thin, paper thin. And so fossilization hasn't always been that fantastic. But anyway, those hollowed out bones was really useful in terms of breathing, more efficient breathing, which is an important requirement in terms of energy and oxygen supply needed to keep an animal flying. Pterosaurs were also endothermic, which means that they were warm-blooded, which is, again, very important because you need to release all that energy when you're in flight. So cold-blooded creatures waiting for the sun to warm them up so they can get that energy, it's not going to happen. So a pterosaur needed that energy, just like a bird does, to get itself aloft and to stay aloft, to flap those huge wings on those downstrokes to keep it flying through those Mesozoic skies. So it's now well understood that pterosaurs were warm-blooded, endothermic. And the eyes were large with a bony ring that supported the eyeball. It's called the sclerotic ring. And then they had the crests, all sorts of different sizes and shapes. And um, the paleo artists have had the most fantastic time giving those crests the most gorgeous, gorgeous colors. And hey, why not? I would also paint crests of pterosaurs in gorgeous colors because modern day birds have most beautiful crests and um, no one really quite knows. I know that there is some research going down and um, paleontologists are able to work out what the colors of some of these creatures actually were but um, also the paleo artists are having a fantastic time coloring in the crests of these wonderful creatures. So well done to the paleo artists. Pterosaurs also had large brains apparently comparable in structure to that of birds and as in that group the ability to see outweighed the ability to smell. And so sight seems to have been the dominant sense in pterosaurs, just like it is in birds. Pterosaurs reproduced by laying eggs, and they found fossil eggs of pterosaurs, and that gives us insights into how they reproduced and, uh, and how they lived in their lifestyles. They weren't in the air all the time, though. They had to live on the ground, nesting, resting, maybe feeding. So paleontologists have done a lot of studies about these things and how they stood and how they walked, and there were differences between the different species. Some species were bipedal, which means that they walked on two legs, while others were quadrupeds, which means that they walked on all fours. And some pterosaurs even had webbed feet. So we're not sure if they were great swimmers though, hey, because they had these big crests and the center of gravity was quite far forward. So it might've been a really tricky thing for them to be able to swim. So those webbed feet might've just been there to keep them from sinking into the mud. Lifestyle and diet. So what did pterosaurs eat? So traditionally we've been always thought that they were lived close to oceans and ate fish. But the thinking's changed a little bit on that too. So most pterosaur remains have been found in sediments. This is where geology comes in. Found in sediments close to, to what were once bodies of water. And, uh, and as such, they have traditionally been thought to have been fish eaters. Some more recent studies have shown that they might have hunted land animals, they might have hunted insects, some might have eaten fruit, and some might have even been predators of other pterosaurs. But due to the lack of fossil evidence, partly due to those very light wings of theirs, little is known about pterosaurs that lived over forests or open plains. There's one pterosaur called a pterodaustro, which had hundreds of fine needle-like teeth, which suggests that it used those teeth for straining plankton. There's another species, Cerodactylus, which possessed larger teeth that splayed outward slightly, which was likely useful for capturing fish and land animals. Other genera, namely Eudemorphodon and Rampharynchus, 
have been found with fish remains in their abdominal cavities, i.e. their stomachs, which shows that they did mostly eat fish, and that's where that idea they live close to oceans came from. So traditionally, two major groups of pterosaurs have been recognized. These are the Ramphorhynchoidea, and that's a term that has included all the basal forms up to the late Jurassic, that is 161 million years ago to 146 million years ago. When we say the basal forms, we mean the more primitive forms. These are typified by relatively long tails, long fifth toes, sharply pointed teeth, and slightly elongated wing metacarpals. If you don't know what a metacarpal is, that's the palm bones, these long bones, rather than your finger bones, your metacarpals. So, Ramphorhynchoids were the first pterosaurs, and they were found in deposits from the late Triassic, which stretched from 237 million years ago to 201 million years ago. Genera of this group include Eudemorphodon and Petinosaurus, both found in Italian Triassic deposits. And these had wingspans of less than one meter, so they were quite small. Dimorphodon, which came from the early Jurassic of England, was about 1.5 meters from wingtip to wingtip. Ramphorhynchus was a late form from the late Jurassic period and had a wingspan of about one meter. However, however, paleontologists have long realized that Ramphorhynchoidea is an artificial grouping of primitive forms. And some members are actually more closely related to the other major group of pterosaurs, the Pterodactyloidea. So that's the other major group. So Pterodactyloids appeared in the middle Jurassic and survived into the Cretaceous when the earlier forms of pterosaurs had become extinct. The oldest known pterodactyloid is Cryptodracon progenitor, whose fossils date back to 163 million years ago. And Cryptodracon was discovered in northwest China, in rocks which are not marine deposits. So this area was far from the sea during the Jurassic times, and that provides strong evidence that pterodactyloids evolved in landlocked environments rather than in marine settings. The earliest late Jurassic pterodactyloid is Pterodactylus, which we've all heard about, pterodactyl, of which numerous individuals are known from the Solhofen limestone in Bavaria in Germany. Pteranodon, which grew to 7 meters, was also a pterodactyloid. So we've already mentioned this, but pterodactyl fossils are very rare due to their light bone construction. And this causes the bones to be poorly preserved in the fossil record. And so, complete skeletons are only occasionally found in the geological record where exceptional preservation conditions exist. And these exceptional conditions are called Lagerstätten from the German. And the late Jurassic Zollhofen limestone in Bavaria is one of these Lagerstätten. In 1784, Italian naturalist Cosimo Alessandro Collini was the first, was the first scientist to discover and describe a pterosaur. Collini couldn't work out how to classify this creature. At the time, at the time, the concepts of evolution and extinction were imperfectly understood. And the bizarre build of this animal with those long fingers was very strange to Collini. And he couldn't, there was no clear animal group to which he could assign that animal, that creature. So Collini suggested that it might be a swimming animal and that it used those long front limbs as paddles and that it was related to Ichthyosauria and Plesiosauria. And those were creatures that swam in the oceans. However, 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 it was a man called Johann Hermann back in 1800 who suggested that those long bones were actually wings and that the skeleton was that of a flying creature. The famous French naturalist Georges Cuvier agreed and coined the term pterodactyle, which means wing finger, which we mentioned earlier. Little movie. This name was Latinized to Pterodactylus, and then it was the great free for all because everybody just dumped all flying reptiles into this genus. And the name Pterodactyl was applied to all members of Pterosauria. However, paleontologists now reserve the name Pterodactyl for a specific genus of pterosaur. The broader term Pterosauria was coined by Johann Jakob Kaup in 1833, but however, in popular culture, we still hear the term pterodactyl. In fact, I hear it every day at the Dino Zone. In 1838, Mary Anning, who lived in England, of She Sells Sea Shells on the Sea Shore fame, discovered the first pterosaur outside of Germany, which was named Dimorphodon by Sir Richard Owen. Dimorphodon was the first non pterodactyloid pterosaur to be discovered and named. Since then, thousands of pterosaur fossil fragments 
have been found in the Cambridge green sands of England, leading to the naming of numerous genera which hitherto were unknown to science. The expert on the subject was a certain Harry Govia Seeley, who also wrote the first pterosaur book called Ornithosauria, and in 1901 the first popular book on the subject, Dragons of the Air. What a great name for a book. Seeley thought that they were warm-blooded dynamic creatures, and in this sense he was perfectly right. He also believed that they were related to birds, which is now proven to be wrong. Richard Owen, being obtuse as always, took a different view, believing them to be cold-blooded reptiles, which is also proven to be wrong. On the other side of the Atlantic, Othniel Charles Marsh. Go and watch our video on the Bone Wars, you'll learn more about him. He found the first pterosaur in America, Pteranodon, in 1879. That was the largest pterosaur ever found up until then, and the first from America. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, back in Europe, the Zollhofen limestone continued to yield up high-quality specimens that allowed the study of pterosaurs to advance in great strides, making the Germans the leading pterosaur researchers in the world. So this research changed our view of these amazing creatures from being cold-blooded, gliding reptiles to warm-blooded, dynamic, powerful flyers that ruled the Mesozoic skies. So well done to the Germans. I was in Munich a few years ago and they had a fantastic pterosaur model there. And, uh, you should go and see it if you're in Germany or in Europe. They've got a couple of really fantastic museums. So popular culture, and we have to straighten some things out here. Pterosaurs are often referred to by the popular media or by the general public as flying dinosaurs. But dinosaurs were defined. This is a great thing. You should learn this thing. You're going to tell your teacher. But dinosaurs are defined as the descendants of the common ancestor of the Saurischia and Ornithischia, which excludes the pterosaurs. Right, say it again. Dinosaurs are defined as the descendants of the last common ancestor of the Saurischia and the Ornithischia, which excludes the pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are nonetheless more closely related to birds and dinosaurs than they are to crocodiles and other living reptiles, although, although they are not bird ancestors. Pterosaurs are also colloquially referred to as pterodactyls particularly in fiction and journalism. But as we've already seen, technically pterodactyl may only refer to members of the, the genus Pterodactylus and more broadly to members of the suborder Pterodactyloidea of the pterosaurs. They've been the staple of popular culture for as long as their cousins the dinosaurs, although they're not usually as featured as prominently in movies and literature or in other art. So the depiction of dinosaurs has really improved over the last 30, 40 years, 50 years since the dinosaur renaissance. And uh, some of those movies reflect, you know, the movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World are kind of buying into a more scientific approach. And they get some really fantastic paleontologists to come and advise them on how these animals behaved. But in terms of pterosaurs, and if you saw Jurassic World, A Fallen Kingdom, you'll see pterosaurs descending and attacking all the members of the public there at the Jurassic World dinosaur center. And that's not true. And then the animals depicted in fiction and pop culture frequently represent either the Pteranodon or Ramphorhynchus, or a fictionalized hybrid of the two. So many children's toys and cartoons feature pterodactyls with Pteranodon-like crests and long Ramphorhynchus-like tails and teeth and a combination that never actually existed in nature. But paleontologists have a sense of humor. And they named one Tyrannosaur with a pterodon-like crest and teeth, Ludodactylus, which, whose name means toy finger for its resemblance to inaccurate children's toys. So Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a book called The Lost World in 1912, where pterosaurs featured large, and then they made a 1925 movie of his book. And then they've appeared in a number of films and television programs, including the 1933 film King Kong, and 1966's One Million Years BC. And then after the 1960s, pterosaurs remained mostly absent from notable American film appearances until 2001's Jurassic Park 3. And paleontologist Dave Hone noted that the pterosaurs in this film had not been significantly updated to reflect modern research. Persistent errors were teeth on a toothless pteranodon, nesting behavior that was known to be inaccurate, and leathery wings rather than the taut membranes of muscle fiber required for pterosaur flight. In most media appearances, pterosaurs are depicted as 
piscivores, which means fish-eating animals, but that doesn't reflect their full dietary variation. They are also often shown as aerial predators similar to birds of prey, grasping human victims with talons on their feet. However, only the small Aneuronathid Vesperopterilis and small Wukongopterids <laughs> what these fantastic names are known to possess prehensile feet and hands respectively. All other pterosaurs have flat plantigrade feet, meaning they put their whole foot on the ground with no opposable toes. This is your opposable finger and thumb, able to grab and carry things. Try that out now. So pterosaurs weren't able to grab their prey with an opposing claws and carry their prey away. Alright, so I think we're pretty much at the end of this little video on pterosaurs, the creatures that rule the sky. So I think you've learned a thing or two, if nothing else but to dispel some silly ideas of what pterosaurs were and who they were related to, and they're not flying dinosaurs. And so now there's nothing left for me to do, well there's two things I need to do, but let's talk about the keys to the dinosaur kingdom. So the first code, because we've got these 10 videos, the first code that you're going to punch in that's going to give you the keys to the dinosaur kingdom is 29835472983547. 29835472983547. Right, so write that down, make a list, you can download actually the little PDF that I'm going to give you the link to, and write the name of the dinosaur movie that you just watched, this one's on pterosaurs, and write that code. And when you've got all 10 of those, you're going to get the keys to the kingdom. And I'll talk more about what's behind the gates of the dinosaur kingdom in the subsequent videos, but it's going to be absolutely fantastic. All right, so the next thing we have to do is say, if you enjoyed this video, please like, please subscribe, please hit that notification button, ring that bell, because that's great for the algorithm, because YouTube doesn't always show you the videos, even though you might be subscribed. And finally, share this video with all those friends and relatives who might also be dinosaur fans. And of course, we want to hear your comments, so please leave those below. Check out our links. As we've already said, follow us here. Go and check out the Dinozone, thedinozone.com. We put blog posts up there and all sorts of interesting things. And uh, if you're in our geographical vicinity, come and visit us at the Dinozone Dinosaur Park, where we've got that replica of a T-Rex and fossils and minerals and a dinosaur dig and competitions and all sorts of amazing stuff. And that, boys and girls, brings us to the end of this little video. Please leave your comments, ask your questions, and tell me what other videos you'd like to see us make here at the Dinosaur. Alright, so I'm out of here. You take care. Until the next one, look after yourselves. Bye!